this morning we're going to have uh, our very own Roy Ward and Oscar, and they're going to do uh, some stuff on the American Civil War. Now this could get a bit dangerous. There's a lot of weaponry and swords and muskets and one thing or another. And I think the safest place to be is probably the car park. <laughs> so we'll all make our way out there. And out. <laughs> okay, guys. Okay, yes. and a round of applause. It's like Alabama in here, it's that warm, we could be in the, the Civil War. <laughs> My name's Oscar Spence. Um, there's a good few of you know me, and uh, I eventually I, I, I ended up working with the Church of Ireland for a number of years as a mediator. I am now an accredited preacher in the Presbyterian Church, and uh, I'm a chaplain to a historical society in Oma the Ulster and American Historical Society. But I'm also studying history at the minute. And uh, my main work that I'm doing is on the Civil War at the minute. And it's actually about Robert E. Lee. But we're not going to talk about Robert E. Lee very much today because by the time I actually sat down and worked through this, I had enough for another talk. So if I'm good, you might ask me back. I don't know. <laughs> I always like to do this before I do a talk, and very briefly, I just want to throw it open to the floor and ask you, what do you know about the Civil War? What do you, is there, is there anything you know about the Civil War? Just somebody shout out something. Roy lost them. Roy lost them. that's true. Why was it fought? It wasn't so much for slavery, it was more for a session. Secession, okay. Not slavery, secession. Anything else? What were the key issues? Does anybody know? Slavery was one of them, yeah, and secession was another one. Anything else? States' rights. States' rights all fits into secession. So you're building up a big picture. I used to be a professional mediator, and uh, I often find that conflicts weren't as cut and dry. Take a look at this. Uh, Take a look at this. Unleashed was a civil war of increasing savagery and enormous destruction. The future was invisible because the past had been a failure. So many low but captivating facts remain in darkness. Professor James Johnson, or Robinson rather, sorry, he sells a lot better than I can, but then he's trying to sell a book, so uh, that's probably his motivation. But as I said before, I found out that as a mediator there wasn't any clean conflict, nothing was cut and dry, and conflicts and wars are messy things. And in the real world, sometimes it's very hard to find uh, a categorically and define the good guy. Or amongst the disputants, who's good and who's bad. It's only in Hollywood that presents this, this picture of good versus evil. But folks, that's to sell movies. It's to sell documentaries. And even when we see in the History Channel, sometimes the facts are distorted. They're simplified. They imply things. And they use conjecture as fact. It makes for good entertainment, but it makes for very bad history. Now some of the things that I'm going to say today might shock you, because the Civil War was very complicated. It was very confusing. It was a conflict full of paradoxes. You know, I'm no expert on the Civil War. I, I like to know a little bit about it, but I'm no expert. But as a history student, I was taught to question things, to critically analyze things, to use credible sources, and that's what I'm going to do here today. And I hope that you enjoy this learning. However, I need to war warn you that uh, if there's any heckling from the, the front here, that I do have a bayonet, and I do have a musket. It's always, I'm a minder, it's always 
hard to know your audience, isn't it? So that's why I, I come ready for war. Well, some people ask me, why do you study American history? Why are you interested in American history? And my answer is very simple. Because I would argue that American colonial history and American 19th century history are intertwined with our own history here in Ireland. The story of the Irish diaspora, the migration of Irish people is an important part of history, it's, but it's also an important part of the fledgling history of the United States. In the 18th century, during the Great Migration from Ulster to America, thousands of Irish men, women and children made their way to the New World. The first ship recorded uh, carrying immigrants was called the Friends Goodwill. It left Larne in 1717, bound for Boston. And between 1717 and 1775, it's estimated that 25,000 people migrated across the Atlantic Ocean in a hope of finding a new life in America. They were mostly Presbyterian dissenters. They were pure, poor yeoman farmers. They had just enough to pay their passage over and perhaps buy a little plot of land. Some were indentured servants, and yet some were even criminals transported to America. But most made their way to Pennsylvania. The author, Billy Kennedy, asserts that by the time of the Revolutionary War in 1775, 90% of the population of Pennsylvania, Virginia, and the Carolinas were Scots-Irish. Historian Gordy Mulgoney has argued that these Ulster Scots settlers were pivotal in shaping the Old South. And our very own Dr. Angela Byrne from Ulster University asserts that the people of the Ulster Scots were so successful in the early years of shaping the American uh, culture that their identity disappeared. In time, their cultural identity became the foundation for what became the cultural norm in those areas, those places in America like the Appalachian Mountains and the Carolinas, they in effect became the people who shaped what the regions looked like. Their music, their words, their traditions in turn shaped the culture that came behind them to settle these areas. Waves of Protestants leaving Ulster were so large that the British government tried to ban migration and put limits on immigration. There was many reasons for leaving Ireland. In 1703, the Test Act prohibited wealthy uh, dissenters from owning and holding office and owning land. The penal laws in Ireland also affected the lower orders. Marriages and baptisms performed by Presbyterian clergy were not recognised in law. And the rationale behind this was simple. The Presbyterians were not legally married, then their children couldn't legally inherit land. In 1713, the Reverend Thomas Winsley, a Presbyterian minister from Straban, was prosecuted for performing a marriage. <coughs> All members of the dissenting clergy had to pay a tithe to the state church. And in 1778, the Anglican Church increased the tithe. But at the same time, the landlords increased their rent. There was a system here in Ireland called rack renting. And it meant that if a tenant did some work on his farm, if they made some improvements to the farm, when the lease was due again, the landlord had the right to raise the rent. So it didn't actually benefit the tenant to work hard on his farm. It impoverished these farmers. And Ulster Scots people wanted to own their own land. They wanted freedom. They wanted to defend their land, to defend their rights. And these were important ideologies that would come and permeate through the South and into the Civil War. Later during the Civil War, even the poorest dirt, dirt farmer that never owned a slave would use these two arguments 
for why they went to war. Ireland was hit by a terrible drought between 1715, I know it's hard to believe, 1715 and 1720. Crops failed, there was famine. The sheep died of a disease called rot. In 1718, there was a smallpox epidemic. The linen industry had a time of boom and bust. It fell into decline. In 1719, the passing of the Toleration Act, the Tolerance Act, allowed the setting Protestants more freedom of worship. But by that time, the Presbyterian Church had split, and this <coughs> contributed to the continual migration into America. Gordon Ramsay of Queen's University, <coughs> not the chef, <laughs> asserts that the Ulster Scots were accustomed to surviving in violent surroundings. First on the borders of Scotland, then in Ulster, and eventually in the frontiers of America. Now some say that this is a myth, this Ulster invincibility. Ulster Scots settlers were again used in America as human shields between Native Americans and civilization. James Logan, the colonial secretary of Pennsylvania, wrote in 1720, I thought it might be prudent to plant a settlement of those who had so bravely defended Derry and Inniskillen at the frontier in case of disturbance. Historian William Morris said of the Ulster Scots settlers that they carried a rifle in one hand and a psalm book in the other. I, I preach in the Presbyterian Church and I can attest that they still do that even to today. <laughs> you don't preach too long in the Presbyterian Church, you get in trouble. Billy Kennedy painted these Ulster Scots settlers as sober, God-fearing people. He asserted that they were sober, God-fearing, hard-working Presbyterians. However, on the other hand, Mulwoney, who we've mentioned already, wrote a book called Cracker Culture, The Celtic Ways in the Old South, and he paints a different picture. Mulwoney wrote that they were hard drinkers, they loved to fill more than the plough, they were argumentative, they disliked authority, they decided their disputes with fighting knives. And we see even the portraits during the Civil War where they carry these, these massive knives with them. <coughs> At the start of the war, they took them to war. And as war went on, they discarded them because they became too heavy. And they found out that they were, they were useless for what they were using them for. But Mulwoney argues that, that these hot-blooded tempered Scots-Irish that this, this, this passion that ran through their veins, that it was a factor in the Civil War. Civil War historian David Blight echoes these beliefs and he said that these hot-headed southerners were completely different than cool New Englanders that came from a very different culture. And each culture failed to understand the other. Now Blight argues that this clash of cultures between North and South was one of the factors for the war. The Irish potato famine was another primary factor in the story of Irish migration to America. Many Irish Catholics sought sanctuary in the cities of the north. However, they were received with consternation. They weren't received into their new home with open arms. The rural Irish peasant farmers were not well suited to urban life in America. And these starving refugees were treated with contempt and accused of spreading dirt and disease. There was a joke said about the Irish man and his pig. Now the cartoons of the day represent the Irish with, with eight light features. They said that they were illiterate. Filthy, drunkards, brawlers. Later during the Civil War, some impoverished Irish chose to emigrate to America in the hope of enlisting in one of the two armies. Around 1,050, sorry, 150,000 Irish-born immigrants 
joined the Union Army. And 40,000 fought for the Confederacy. That's big numbers. They were not motivated by moral or by American politics. But they wanted to escape the poverty that was here in Ireland. Others wanted to gain military training and experience, which they hoped to use to come back to Ireland and drive the British out of Ireland. There's some famous names in the Civil War, and they had Irish roots. Confederate General Thomas Stonewall Jackson's father came from Coleraine. Confederate uh, General Johnson James Pettigrew's family came from Tyrone. Confederate General Jeb Stewart's family came from this city. Union General Thomas Francis Mahar was born in Wexford and he was the commander of the Irish Brigade. And Union General James Shields was from Dungannon in County Tyrone and was the general who took on Stonewall Jackson during his Shenandoah Valley campaign. Two Scots-Irish facing each other on two opposing, uh, two opposing sides. Union General Thomas Sweeney came from Cork and after the war he led a, Republic, an, a Republican invasion uh, into, into British Canada. So we see this picture of how many Irish is involved in this conflict. Historians still argue over the causes of the Civil War. The war is contentious and people in the north and people in the south still argue of what it's even called. However, these names are very telling. They're telling because they give us a snapshot and a picture of the issues that was surrounding the dispute. In the north, the war was a rebellion. In the south, it was a second revolution. In the north, they were fighting to consolidate the federal power. In the south, they were fighting for states' rights, for states to rule their individual places where they were. In the north, some were fighting for emancipation to enslave African Americans. And in the south, they viewed the war as an attack of Lincoln on their God-given right to own slaves. And it should be noted that there was also slave states in the Union. It was legal in Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky and Missouri to own slaves. And at the start of the war, these slave states fought for the Union and continued to fight for the Union. If you were a layman and you asked somebody today what you thought that the, the Civil War was about, the majority of people would say, well, Abraham Lincoln went to war to free the slaves. But I'm going to confuse you now. I'm even going to confuse you further. I want to say that the Union went to war not to emancipate the slaves, but to save the Union. That the war was all about slaves, but yet it had nothing to do with slaves. The war was also an economic war. It was about the industrialization of the North and the exporting of cotton from the South to England to feed the Industrial Revolution. It was about westward expansion. It was about a clash of cultures. It was about how one side interpreted the other side. It was about different ways of life. The federal government and the president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, went to war to preserve the Union. It was not to free the slaves. Lincoln wrote a letter to Horace Greeley, the editor of the pro-Republican New York Tribune, on the 22nd of August, 1862. He said, I would save, in the shortest way, under the Constitution, the sooner the national authority can be restored. The nearer the Union will be to the Union, the nearer the Union will be the Union as it was. If there will be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. If there were those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount objective in the struggle 
is to save the Union. And it might surprise you that many of Lincoln's, uh, or, or sorry, many of Lincoln's circle and Lincoln himself were not abolitionists. Furthermore, due to the, the racial prejudice that existed in the 19th century, he would never have voted or have been voted as President of the United States if he had been an abolitionist. During his speech in 1858, Lincoln said, I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favour of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. It was only over a period of time that Lincoln would change his mind and his idea of slavery would evolve. But this idea of racial hierarchy was prevalent in the 19th century. Charles Darwin was an abolitionist. He hated slavery. He wrote about the great sin of slavery being almost universal. However, Darwin also wrote in a letter dated 1862, one year after the beginning of the Civil War, that over the next 500 years, the Anglo-Saxon race would replace and eradicate the lower races. Can I ask you to look at this picture for a moment? What do you see? Tell me. Can anybody see anything? It's very hard. These are very old pictures. Anybody? Well, first of all, these are those are both Union trips, okay? But second of all, I want to show you something now. Let's see if does this pointer work. I'm scared to press anything in case it blows up. We see here in the foreground a little black kid. We see a black man sitting here. These were servants. Servants to the Union Army. And if you notice what's going on here, the African American is sitting on the ground while the men are seated above him. The African American is hunched on the ground while the men are standing around him. And this gives us a snapshot of what life was like in America. Lincoln believed that slavery was morally wrong. But as a lawyer, he didn't know how to handle it because it didn't breach the Constitution. And in 1854, he admitted this. He says, I do not know how to address this issue. It might shock you to find this out. That the commanding general of the Confederacy, Robert E. Lee, also believed in saving the Union. Robert E. Lee was a Federalist like his father. His father was Light Horse Harry Lee. He believed in a strong federal government. And on the 18th of April, 1861, Abraham Lincoln offered Robert E. Lee, a colonel at this stage in the United States Army, full command of the Union Army. Lee is the only commander that has ever been offered the same command of an army in two opposing sides in a conflict. Lee met with uh, politician Francis Blair and during the meeting Lee is reputed to have said to Blair, Mr. Blair, I look upon secession as anarchy. If I owned four million of slaves in the south, I would sacrifice them all for the Union. But how can I draw my sword upon my native Virginian state? And so what Lee was saying was that he believed in the Union, but his draw to his own native Virginia was bigger and greater. How could he turn on his friends and family? And a later in a letter dated the twenty second or twenty seventh of December, eighteen fifty six, Lee wrote to his wife Mary about slavery. I believe but what and acknowledge that slavery is an institution, is a moral and political evil in any country. It is useless to expand it and its disadvantages. I think, however, a greater evil to the white man than the black races. And while my feelings are strongly enlisted on behalf of the latter, my sympathies are more strong to the former. 
He's a white man. His sympathy goes to the white people, but his sympathy goes to the black man, to the African American. How long after their subjugation may it be necessary is unknown and ordered by a wise, merciful providence that their emancipation will sooner result from the mind and from mild and melting influence of Christianity rather than the storms and tempest of con con controversy. Lee was a man who, like Lincoln, morally detested slavery. However, he didn't know what to do about it. He didn't know how to stop it. And therefore, he leaves it to the providence of God. He hates abolitionists. And he hates the abolitionist movement because he blames it for destroying the church in America. Lee was also present on the 17th of October, 1859, and was the commanding officer of the detachment that arrested the abolitionist John Brown at Harper's Ferry during his rebellion there. In 1854, Lincoln publicly advocated the colonization of black Americans. Lincoln stated that he would free all the slaves and send them to Liberia. Lincoln believed that the white and black could not live together, that their differences between the two races were too great. It would be better for us, he says, therefore, to separate. In 1863, colonization featured in his first draft of the Emancipation Proclamation, and it was only then removed in the January of that year. White Anglo-Saxon Americans believed that it was their God-given manifest destiny to settle America, to own America. They believed that God had given them America to do what they wanted with. And this argument would be used again with the Native Americans. And what I am arguing is that Lincoln and even Darwin and people like Lee they were men of their time. They were 19th century men who had a different view of race. They had a different view than we today have of race. It doesn't pardon them and it doesn't pardon the suffering of, of the slaves that were held in bondage in the south. But it does explain why it happened. It might also shock you to know that the decision to free slaves was not out of any moral motive. It was a military motive. The enslaved in the South were crucial to the Confederate war effort. The South had less fighting men of military age than the North. And so slaves were needed to do the manual jobs, to labor, to build roads, to dig ditches, and then for uh, allow the, the white uh, Southerners to fight. And so, by freeing the slaves, you find that this hit the Confederacy hard. But then, what did the Irish think? What did the Irish think of slavery? What did the Irish think of race? The majority of Irish in the north and Irish in the south found themselves on the lowest tier of society. They were white crackers, as we talked about before. The word crack, Mulhoney says, came from a Scottish word. And this become known as crackers, these cracker farmers. They were subsistence farmers. They didn't own slaves. They worked as laborers. But the only racial group below the Irish was the African Americans. And this is one factor why both North and South, the Irish were sympathetic towards slavery in America. The enslaved ensured that the Irish would not be grouped <coughs> with the African Americans and would not drop down a social tier, this idea of racial hierarchy. The Irish saw that the, the newly freed African Americans would be a threat to their livelihood and to the, the manual laboring jobs that they did. So in September of 1862, President Abraham Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation that runaway slaves then began to, to migrate and slaves that were freed in the south began to migrate to the north. 
The 2001 two economists wrote a paper and they published it about desertion rates in the Civil War. And from 1862, the, des the desertion rates in the Northern uh, and the Union Army began to rise. Why? Because they didn't want to fight and die for black men. They joined the war to fight for the Union, not to free black men. And so the soldiers were unhappy. But not only the soldiers were unhappy. In 1863, New York burned in an inferno of riots against the New Draft Act. Legislation was passed in Congress that all men between the ages of 20 and 45 should be drafted for military service. There was anger and mobs took to the streets. Workers, most of them were Irish, were angry that the wealthy could pay $300 to purchase their exemption to the draft. But the Irish refused to fight for the Negroes. I'm using the language of the day, but folks, I'm cleaning it up. They refused and said categorically, we will not fight for the Negro. Many innocent African Americans were lynched and murdered during the riots. William Jones, uh, an African American dock worker, was hung in the street and then his body was set on fire. Their homes were sacked. A colored orphanage was raised to the ground. And Union regiments coming back from the Battle of Gettysburg were sent to New York to stop the carnage. Both the Union and the Confederate government recognized the importance of the Irish and their contribution of manpower to the war. The Union held some recruitment meetings here in Ireland and there was a general consensus however from 1864 within the Catholic Church and the Nationalist press that discouraged Union recruitment here in Ireland. Lincoln's Republican Party in America were anti-Irish. And most Irish settled or sided with the, the Democrats. There was a push from the Democrat ranks to end the war, to slip for peace. And so such leanings began to permeate through the Irish communities. And they were known as copperheads. Father John Bannon, a Confederate Army chaplain, visited Ireland in 1864 on a recruitment drive for the Confederate Army. But Bannon was received by Archbishop Paul Cullen of Dublin. The Irish nationalist position on the American Civil War was one that was favourable because they believed that the Confederates were in rebellion as they too were in rebellion. I wonder, can you think for a moment what a Civil War battle was like? Look at the screen.
That film was called Wicked Spring, and the reason I showed you it was it actually won an award for its reality. Can you imagine what it was like to stand in that, in a hail of bullets? A Union soldier once wrote that when he stood in a war, he heard above his head hornets, and he realised then that it was the many bullets that had been fired at him. Death in the Civil War was terrible. The death toll in the Civil War was staggering. Two Union officers, William Fox and Thomas Livermore, they estimated that 620,000 souls perished. But in 2011, David Hacker questioned this and said that the figures were actually more. Fox and Livermore had used pensions and battle reports to make up their figures. However, these were notoriously inaccurate. And most of the papers from the Confederacy were destroyed at the end of the war. Hacker places the death toll at 75000. Each one of those is a human life. He used computer software new techniques to find and come up to this, this conclusion. But one of the problems during the Civil War was the mini ball. It was a new form of bullet, a hard lead slug that tumbled in the air. It was slow as it flew and when it impacted on bone it shattered it. It cut through skin. And this is why we see so many uh, forms of amputations done in the Civil War. Now this is a, a mini ball shot in a bucket of clay. You see a second word war bullet on the left. See the size of the other one. said before so many amputations happened. It wasn't that the surgeons were bad or the surgeons were lazy and wanted to cut off limbs. The fact was that if a mini ball hit your arm, most likely it would take your arm off. If it hit your torso, the entry wound would be big but the exit wound would be even bigger. It would blow the most of, of your back out. So many people died because of this. There were various causes of death in the Civil War. Men were killed in action, they died of their wounds, they died of infection, they died in accidents. They were murdered. There was lots of crime during the Civil War. They were executed. They were put to death. They committed suicide. But the greatest killer in the Civil War was disease. Because two out of every three soldiers would die from disease with perhaps not even firing their rifle in anger. The concept of germ theory was not yet established. And people believed that disease spread through miasmas, dirty, bad air. And men would cook and drink and wash and go to the loo in the same water, in the same stream. There was efforts to improve sanitation, but many of the men were ignorant to this and they ignored it. Robert E. Lee wrote to his wife Mary on the 17th of September 1861, Our poor sick, I know suffer much. They bring it on themselves by not doing what they are told. They are worse than children for the latter can be forced. Officers told them to wash. Officers told them not to use the toilet in the water. Officers told them to do this, but the men were poor, ignorant farm boys. 
and didn't know what they're doing. Childhood disease is like measles. The flu. Chicken pox. These men had lived in rural communities and when they were grouped together in these masses of men, disease spread throughout the armies. But the good death was also important in the Civil War. Pat Gerard asserts that it was important in the 19th century to have a good death. And the good death followed a, a ritual. And it followed the ethos of Protestant evangelistic belief. And it was also romantic. You see, death was the last battle that anyone had to co conquer in their, in their time of life. People usually died at home in beds surrounded by their family. There was often hymns singing. There was often prayers said to soothe the dying. They had time to say goodbye, to put their affairs in order. It was important for the dying person to stay composed with dignity, to bear the pain. It was important that they would make a profession of faith or in the Catholic tradition to receive the last rites. It was important that they stayed lucid until the end of death so that they would truly know that they would be saved and then pass into the, the next world. Drew Gilton Frost wrote a fantastic book called The Republic of Suffering. I think PBS made a documentary called Death in the Civil War. But she argues that the Civil War changed the way Americans thought about death. It was such a massive shock to the Americans. They weren't ready for it. And there was so much death on such a scale that nobody had time for farewells. Nobody had time for this ritual. But yet we see the soldiers trying to recre recreate these rituals. Soldiers tried to recreate this good death. They replaced their family with their friends gathered around them. In fact, soldiers have been found lying as they died. They placed the photographs of their wife and children around them. Often chaplains or orderlies or even other soldiers would dictate time their last words. And in these last words, often it would be, well, tell my mother or tell my father that I died bravely, that I die here knowing that I'm going to heaven. But the 19th century Christian also believed that they needed their entire body intact for the resurrection. General Stonewall Jackson had his amputated arm. He lost his arm in Chancellorsville. And he had his chaplain actually give the arm a full burial so that when he went to heaven it would be united with him. But people at home had to die or had to had to work on the fact that their loved ones were missing, their loved ones were dead, their loved ones were related. How do people work with that? I'm going to ask our friend Roy up for a while. He's going to give us a bit of a hand here. This is private work. So, he's from the 22nd North Carolina Regiment. 